Thank you. The medieval ball, wasn't it? Thank you, Nepal and the Germans. The National Trust showed people around. <laughs> yeah. be worthy. But I hope you will excuse this sedentary talk today. <laughs> it's, uh, I, I, I think sometimes it's possible to overdo it. <laughs> I fear that I have. But normal service will be resumed <laughs> by next week. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Blessed Lord, who has caused all Holy Scripture to be written for our learning, grant that we may in such wise hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that by patience and comfort of thy holy word, we may ever behold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which thou hast given us in our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> now, if you remember last time, um, Saul was hunting David down, saying, this man's out to get me, um, and Saul went to leave himself in a cave, and David cut off the, the skirt of his cloak and was able to say, look, I could have killed you. And Saul had to acknowledge, David is the better man. But as a lot of these um, stories of Saul and David, they come in, in pairs, and so you get a very similar story, um, which we'll have later on. But uh, first of all, we have another um, uh, detail, which we're going to get three times, the beginning of chapter 25. And Samuel died, and all Israel gathered and mourned him, and they buried him at his home, and Ramah, and David arose and went down to the wilderness of Paran. And that's all we hear about that for now, but even though the, there's going to be another book of Samuel, even after he's died, but remember, originally it's just one book. And there was a man in Maon whose stock was in Carmel, and the man was very great. He had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats. And it happened when he was shearing his sheep in Carmel, and the man's name was Nabal, and his wife's name was Abigail. And the woman had a good mind and lovely looks, but the man was hard and evil in deeds and a Calebite. <laughs> David heard in the wilderness that Nabal was shearing his sheep. Now, Nabal <laughs> actually means worthless man. So, <laughs> so was he really called Nabal or is this the name that's come down to us? Um, difficult to know. Uh, it's not a name I've ever uh, been asked to baptise a baby. <laughs> um, or it could be uh, that it was a Calebite name and um, you know it's only a ha happy kind of providence that in, uh, in Hebrew it means that. Who were the Calebites? Um, well they were um, non-Israelites who kind of piggybacked on the tribe of Judah um, and uh, medieval Hebrew commentators um, said that um, uh, their name suggested that they were dog-like so they're kind of seen as uh, uh, parasites but Nabal is very rich but he's a hard man he's a nasty man but he has this wonderful wife who really uh, is the heroine of this particular episode Abigail who's both clever and beautiful. And David hears that he's up there shearing his sheep. And David sent ten lads, and David said to the lads, go up to Carmel and come to Nabal and ask him in my name how he fares and say, thus may it be this time next year that you fare well and your house fare well and all that is yours fare well. Well, that sounds like a lovely greeting, until you stop to think about it a little bit more. I remember being in South Africa, and if you park your car, somebody came, comes up and says that for a small fee, he or she will look after your car and make sure nothing bad happens to it, so that when you come back, the car will still be there. And you would be, I suspect, very unwise not to pay that person, um, because the correlation between not having your protector in the car, uh, having something terrible happen to it, is probably very high. Um, or it's a bit like, um, uh, you know, a sort of mafia protection racket. So David sends his, his boys to say, 
Nice to see you well, Mabel. Everything thriving, is it? Brilliant. It'd be wonderful if you were still as thriving in a year's time, wouldn't it? <laughs> and so, I have heard that they are doing your shearing. Now, the shepherds who belong to you were with us. We did not humiliate them, and nothing of theirs was missing the whole time they were at Carmel. Ask your lads and they will tell you. And may our lads find favour in your eyes, for we have come on a festive day. Give, pray, whatever you can to your servants and to your son, to David. So again, David uses this very kind of um, humble language. You know, I'm just your son, you're the big important man. But I would point out that when your shepherds were with, with us, they didn't, uh, no, no harm came to them, nothing went missing. We wouldn't want that to change, would we? <laughs> and David's lads came and spoke to Nabal all these words in David's name, and they paused. And Nabal answered David's servants and said, Who is David? And who is the son of Jesse? These days many are the slaves breaking away from their masters. <clears throat> And shall I take my bread and my water and my meat that I slaughtered for my shearers and give it to men who came from I know not where? So Nabal uh, doesn't play the game. Uh, in fact, he echoes you know, Saul's words, the son of Jesse, he calls him, rather contemptuous. And he says, well, as far as I know, he's just a slave who's run away from his master Saul. Remember that, uh, well, this is about the only time we hear Nabal speaking at all, but the first words that you hear anyone speaking in the Bible tell you their character. And you notice that sentence there tells you how utterly self-centred he is. In one sentence, he talks about me or I eight times. <laughs> and shall I take my bread and my water and my meat that I slaughtered for my shearers and give it, come, give it to men come from I know not where. So, uh, Nabal is, is not a good man. And David's lads whirled round on their way and went back and told him all these words. So they go straight back to David, tell him what Nabal said. It's not going to go down well. In fact, David has really got to keep up his prestige in the front of, in front of these lads if he's going to continue to be the, you know, the, 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 the gorilla leader out in the mountains. And David said to his men, Every man gird his sword, and every man girded his sword, and David too girded his sword, sword. and about 400 men went up after David, while 200 stayed with the gear. So they remembered <laughs> the numbers that they were before, and he started with 400 men, uh, but then he, he went up to 600 after freeing the town from the Philistines, and he has 600 now, because 200 are left in reserve to guard um, their gear. 400 come with him. And to Abigail, the wife of Nabal, one of the lads told, saying, Look, David sent messengers from the wilderness to greet our master, and he pounced on them. And the men have been very good to us, and we were not humiliated. And we missed nothing the whole time we went about with them when we were out in the field. They were a wall around us both night and day, and the whole time we were with them tending the sheep. And now mark and see what you must do, for the evil is resolved against our master and against all his house, and he is such a scoundrel, no one can speak to him. <laughs> well, several things we learned there. Firstly, Abigail is the one that they go to. Um, she's obviously the one they know. The mistress has got common sense. And in fact, they're not afraid to say to her, your husband's a scoundrel. Um, suggests that she's already said this at some point herself, I suggest. And um, they say, you've got to do something. But we also don't actually, uh, I was perhaps a little over cynical in talking about David's sort of protection racket. Actually, we, you know, the, the shepherds say, no, they were really good to us. They really did protect us. And, and um, now we've alienated them. And he's the big guy in the district. This is not good news. And Abigail hurried and fetched 200 loaves of bread and two jugs of wine 
and five dressed sheep. I think that means that they're <laughs> dressed to eat, <laughs> not, 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 not in dinner jackets. You know. <laughs> and five hundred sears of parched grain, and a hundred raisin cakes, and two hundred big cakes, and she put them on the donkeys. A bit like, do you remember when uh, Jacob is coming to meet Esau and Esau has 400 men with him and Jacob's thinking, he's going to kill me, he's got 400 men, so he sends ahead all these sheep and goats and oxen and they all bow down to him and all these, uh, these gifts. Abigail has obviously realised the same thing, he's got, she's got to appease David. And she said to her lads, pass on ahead of me and I'll be coming right after you. So again, she's going to come last once he's calmed down because she doesn't know that he won't kill her if she just arrives at the first uh, meeting. But her husband, she did not tell. So uh, Abigail's got to sort this out herself. Um, Interesting, isn't it? It's, it's an, another example, a bit like um, um, with um, uh, Jael and Sisera um, and all those other examples, Ruth, uh, that we see of, of the woman takes the initiative and she's the one who saves the day and she is the saviour of all these um, employees uh, who are of Nabal, who otherwise would be wiped out. And she was riding on the donkey, coming down under the cover of the mountain. And look, David and his men were coming down toward her, and she met them. And David said, All in vain did I guard everything that belonged to this fellow in the wilderness, and nothing was missing from all that was his, and he paid me back evil for good. Thus may God do to David, and even more, if I leave from all that is his until morning, a single pisser against the wall. <laughs> now, you might think that's a rather vulgar expression. This is always a trendy modern translation. Actually, no, the modern translations tend to say just a man of his camp. Um, but the Hebrew says, one who pisses against the wall. Um, and older translations... Uh, were quite happy to say, I shall not leave him one man that pisseth against the wall. Um, so the Bible is often a lot more straightforward and direct. Um, in fact, Abigail would have been all right, he's only going to kill the men on this occasion. <laughs> um, but uh, it's still, he's pretty angry. And Abigail saw David and hurried and got down from the donkey and flung herself on her face before David and bowed to the ground just like Jacob before Esau. And she flung herself at his feet and said, My Lord is the blame, but let your servant speak in your ears and hear the words of your servant. Pray, let not my Lord pay mind to this scoundrel of a man, to Nabal, for just like his name he is. His name means base, and baseness is with him. And as for me, your servant, I never saw my Lord's lads whom you sent. And now, my Lord, as the Lord lives and as you live, the Lord who kept you from coming into blood guilt with your own hand rescuing you. And now, like a navel, may your enemies be who seek evil against my Lord. And now this blessing that your servant has brought to my Lord, let it be given to the lads who go about in the footsteps of my Lord. Forgive, pray, the crime of your servant. For the Lord will surely make for my Lord a stalwart house. For my Lord fights the battles of the Lord, and no evil will be found in you all your days. And when a person rises to pursue you to seek your life, my Lord's life will be bound in the bundle of the living with the Lord your God and the lives of your enemies. He will sling from the hollow of the sling. And so, when the Lord does for my Lord all the good that he has spoken about you, and he appoints you prince over Israel, this will not be a stumbling and trepidation of the heart to my Lord, to have shed blood for no cause, and for my Lord to have carried out his own rescue. Then will the Lord do well with my Lord, and he will remember your servant. That's quite a long speech, and it's an impressive speech. First of all, she says, 
It's all my fault. Well, actually, it's not. It's my husband's. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit, you know, like that faulty towers bit when, <laughs> when uh, he, uh, Sybil sends Basil to go and apologise. He's practising, saying all the way up the stairs, I'm sorry I've made a mistake. I'm sorry I've made a mistake. And he goes and says, I'm sorry my wife has made the most terrible mistake. <laughs> oh, Abigail does this. Uh, and again, she's very frank, isn't she? She says, my husband is an absolute scoundrel. Um, he's called base, he is base, take no notice of him, I didn't know anything about this. And she says, look, if you kill him though, you'll be guilty of blood guilt. And she knows, somehow, David has a sensitive conscience. Even though Saul was out to kill him, David would not slay Saul. And, and so she appeals to David's good nature, and she says, you're going to be Lord over Israel. She knows that too. Um, and she says, when that happens, you don't want anything to have stained the way you got there. If the Lord wants you to be king over Israel, and he does, he'll get you there and he'll slay your enemies for you. And there's always almost the implication that you need an able to me, and uh, I'll know how to deal with him. So it's, it's a very, um, it's a very impressive speech, and has that lovely phrase at the end. Um, my Lord's life will be bound in the bundle of the living with the Lord your God, and the lives of your enemies he will sling from the hollow of the sling. She knows David's been a shepherd, and it's like you know, his his bundle of stones, they're going to be kept safe, whereas <coughs> the enemies will be thrown out. And then right at the end, there's almost a sort of seductive line. She says, and when all this happens, remember your servant. And David said to Abigail, Blessed is the Lord God of Israel, who has sent you this day to meet me. And blessed is your good sense, and blessed are you, for this day you held me back from coming into blood guilt with my own hand rescuing me. And yet, as the Lord God of Israel lives, who kept me from harming you, had you not hurried and come to meet me, there would have been left a navel by morning's light, not a single pisser against this wall. So David says, yes, I was going to kill the lot and thank you for stopping me. Um, and it repeats the theme, really, that he, he expressed when he made that fabulous speech to Goliath and said, don't rely on armies, on men, on the might of people, rely on the Lord your God. And so he says, I know I don't need to rescue myself, the Lord's going to do that for me. And David took from her hand what she had brought him, and to her he said, go up in peace to your house, see I have heeded your voice and granted your petition. And Abigail came to Nabal, and look, he was having himself a feast in his house, like a king's feast. And Nabal's heart was of good cheer, and he was exceedingly drunk. <laughs> and she told him nothing, neither great nor small. And it happened in the morning, when the wine was gone out of Nabal, that his wife told him these things, and his heart died within him, and he became like a stone. And it happened after about ten days that the Lord smote Nabal, and he died. So, indeed, um, is there something we're not being told about what Abigail did to Nabal? <laughs> or did she, was she simply a kind of an uh, intelligent psychologist who who knew if he's so humiliated, um, you know, it'll finish him. So does he have, you know, a stroke or a heart attack when he discovers, well, actually, we gave David a wonderful present, and, um, uh, you know, so all the all hard man act goes for nothing. And, indeed, this all comes out well for David. Everything goes well for David, doesn't it, at the moment. And David heard that Nabal had died and said, Blessed is the Lord! who has taken up my cause of insult against Nabal and his servant. Uh, sorry, uh, Na against Nabal and his servant he has withheld from evil, and Nabal's evil the Lord has brought down from his own head. A little aside, I suppose there's a kind of spiritual moral lesson for us here. We're, we're often tempted, aren't we, to want to kind of take revenge on our enemies, 
Um, not perhaps to the extent that David was going to and not put a single pisser against the wall, but actually, <coughs> be like David, leave it to God. He'll sort it all out. And David sent and spoke out for Abigail to take her as wife. So David is clearly impressed by her common sense, by her high intelligence, and by her beauty. And David's servants came to Abigail at Carmel and spoke to her, saying, David sent us to you to take you to him as wife. Um, doesn't seem to be much um, a question of her having to consent to this, but um, she's kind of made an offer anyway uh, when she said, and when all this happens, when Nabal's knocked out, just remember me. And she arose and bowed her face to the ground and said, Look, your servant is but a slave girl to wash the feet of my Lord's servants. <laughs> I think a a Abigail knows how to flatter. <laughs> and Abigail hurried and rose and rode on the donkey, her five young women walking behind her, and she went after David's messengers, and she became his wife. And Ahinoam, David had taken from Jezreel, and both of them became his wives. So we suddenly learn that David actually has got another wife that we didn't know about up until now as well. We don't know much about Ahinoam of Jezreel. It's disputed quite how many wives did David have, at least five. Um, and of course we know about another one already, Michal, the daughter of Saul. However, and Saul had given Michal, his daughter, David's wife, to Palti, son of Laish, who was from Galim. So Saul is so angry with David, actually, when he goes off the scene, he withdraws the honour debt that he had to give Michal to David as wife. Perhaps he's furious with her for helping David escape as well, and he gives her to this other man, to Palti. It's a rather tragic story when David finally um, gains power, he summons Michal back again. But it's never the same between them. You probably remember the scene when he brings the ark into Jerusalem and she looks out the window and despises him. But there's another not so well-known scene before that of she's on her way back to David. He's said, right, get, you know, get my wives back. And Palti, the other man that she was given to, is absolutely devastated. And he follows her, weeping all of the way. Um, and so perhaps there was actually a genuine love match between Palti and Michal. It's rather sad, and you know, David wants her back for the sake of status and pride, um, uh, but Michal is, is kind of the victim of that, which puts another complexion on her rather haughty words later on. Um, the Bible never actually condemns polygamy, but implicitly it does, because every time we see um, these people having lots of wives, it's a disaster. You think of Rachel and Leah, you think of um, Sarah um, and uh, Hagar, you see David and his wives, and of course with Solomon it's going to be an even bigger disaster. Chapter 26 sounds a bit familiar. And the Ziphites came to Saul at Gibeah saying, Is not David hiding out in the hill of Hakila facing the wasteland? So we've heard this before. Is it the Ziphites coming again, or is this simply another version of the same story? Not sure. And Saul arose and went down to the wilderness of Ziph, and with him, 3,000 picked men of Israel to seek David in, David in the wilderness of Ziph. And Paul, Saul camped at the hill of Hakilah, which is facing the wasteland along the way. And David was staying in the wilderness. And he saw that Saul had come after him into the wilderness. And David sent spies. And he knew with certainty that Saul had come. And David arose and came to the place where Saul had camped. And Saul saw the place where Saul lay, and Abner, son of Ner, and Saul were lying within the staging ground, and the troops were encamped about him. So Abner is actually Saul's uncle and the commander of his army. And David spoke up and said to Ahimelech the Hittite, and to Abishai, son of Zeruiah, saying, who will come down with me to Saul to the camp? 
And Abishai says, I on my part shall go down with you. And David came, and Abishai, to the troops by night. And look, Saul was lying asleep within the staging ground, his spear thrust, thrust into the ground at his head, and Abner and the troops were lying around him. Abishai, by the way, is David's, um, uh, David's nephew. Um, so uh, Zeruiah is David's sister, and so as we can assume that Abishai is one of his closest confidants. And later on we hear about um, you know, David gets rather frustrated with these sons of Zeruiah who are always causing trouble for him by being a bit too impetuous and a bit too violent. And, day, and Abishai said to David, God has this day delivered your enemy into your hand. And now let me pray, strike him through with the spear into the ground just once. I will not need a second blow. Remember before in the cave, and the men were saying, come on, get him. And David had to hold them back. The same is happening. And David said to Abishai, do no violence to him. For who can reach out his hand against the, Lord anoint, the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? Once again, David has this conscience which stops him from doing wrong, and it's actually his secret weapon, because um, God brings him uh, into his place without him conspiring. And David said, as the Lord lives, the Lord will smite him, or his day will come, and he will die, or in battle he will go down and perish. The Lord forbid that I should reach out my hand against the Lord's anointed. And so now take, pray, the spear which is at his head, and the water jug, and let us go off. So David says, no, if God wants to kill him, God will kill him. But uh, it's not for us to make that choice. So David is he's a witness, isn't he, to the sanctity of human life. And David took the spear and the water jug at Saul's head, and they went off with no one seeing and no one knowing and no one waking, for they were all asleep, for the Lord's deep slumber had fallen upon them. So we see that there is a protagonist here who can't be seen, and that's the Lord. Uh, and he is uh, acting according to his providence. And David crossed over to the opposite slope and stood on the mountain top from afar. Great was the distance between them. And David called out to the troops and to Abner, son of Ner, saying, Will you not answer, Abner? And Abner answered and said, Who are you that you have called out to the king? And David said to Abner, are you not a man? And who is like you in Israel? And why have you not guarded the Lord your king? For one of the troops has come to do violence to the king your lord. It is not good, the thing that you have done, as the Lord lives, for you all deserve death, because you did not guard your master, the Lord's anointed. So David turns the tables on all of them and says, OK, you're coming out to me, you say, I want to kill the king. Well, you're the ones who failed to protect him. You ought to die. And now see here, <coughs> our king's spear and the water jug that were at his head. And Saul recognised David's voice and he said, Is this your voice, my son, David? Just what we heard last time. And David said, it is my voice, my lord, the king. There's less affection in what David says this time. Before he, he called him, he described himself as your son, and my father. And he said, why is it that my lord chases after his servant? For what have I done? And what evil is in my hand? And now let my lord, the king, hear, pray the words of his servant. If the lord has incited you against me, let him be appeased by an offering. And if it be men, cursed are they before the Lord, for they have banished me today from joining the Lord's inheritance, saying, go serve other gods. Here's again um, David's piety. What is it that David most regrets about his exile? He cannot worship the Lord in the tabernacle, because that's in the possession, presumably, of Saul. He's exiled from uh, Israel's religion. And now let not my blood fall to the ground away from the Lord's presence. For the king of Israel has come forth to seek a single flea, as he would chase a partridge in the mountains. 
again, like the metaphor last week of the dead dog and the flea on the dead dog. And he says, why are you hunting a flea as though you were going partridge shooting? And Saul said, I have offended. Come back, my son David, for I will not harm you again. Inasmuch as my life was precious in your eyes this day, I have played the fool and have erred gravely. And David answered and said, Here is the king's spear. Let one of the lads cross over and take it. And the Lord will pay back to a man his right actions and his loyalty. For the Lord gave you today into my hand, and I did not want to reach out my hand against the Lord's anointed. And look, just as I valued your life highly today, may the Lord value my life highly, and may he save me from every strait. And Saul said to David, Blessed are you, my son David. You shall surely do much, and you shall surely win out. And David went on his way, but Saul returned to his place. So David isn't going to fall for Saul. He's kind of going, oh, I'm sorry, come back. <laughs> you know, because he knows that Saul is, is well, he's crazed, and he'll say that one day, and he'll be saying, oh, well, that's lovely lyre playing, and then suddenly he'll try to pin him to the wall with a spear. We will read one more chapter. You remember before that David went to Achish, king of the Philistines, and he didn't want to be kind of suspected, so he pretended to be a madman, drooling into his beard. Well, he now he goes out to the Philistines again. It's the best place to get away from Saul. But he plays another good trick on Achish. And David said in his heart, Now I shall perish one day by the hand of Saul. There was nothing better for me than to make certain I'd get away to Philistine country. Then Saul will despair of seeking me any more through all the territory of Israel, and I shall get away from him. And David arose, and he crossed over, he and the six hundred men who were with him, to Achish, son of Maok, Ma king of Gath, Gath being where Goliath came from. And David stayed with Achish in Gath, he and his men, each man with his household. David, with his two wives, Ahinoam, the Jezreelite, and Abigail, Abigail, wife of Nabal the Carmelite. Well, she's not wife of Nabal the Carmelite anymore, but she was. And it was told to Saul that David had fled to Gath, and he no longer sought after him. And David said to Achish, If, pray, I have found favour in your eyes, let them give me a place in one of the outlying towns that I may dwell there. For why should your servant dwell in the royal town with you? And Achish gave him Ziklag on that day. Therefore has Ziklag belonged to the kings of Judah until this day. And the span of time that David dwelled in Philistine country was a year and four months. And David went up and his men with him, and they raided the Gesherite, and the Gerizite, and the Amalekite, for they were inhabitants of the land of old, till you come to Shur, and to the land of Egypt. And David struck the land, and he left not a man or woman alive, and he took sheep and cattle and donkeys and camels and clothes, and returned and came to Achish. Now, <coughs> I think we can leave aside for the moment our own kind of horror at all this destruction. The point is that David is doing what Saul was meant to do. He's putting the enemies of the Lord under the pan. But that's not what he tells Achish. And Achish said, where were you raiding now? And David said, oh, the Negev of Judah and the Negev of the uh, Jeshmelite and the Negev of the Kenite. So he says, oh, I've been out killing killing the Israelites. Of course he hasn't. And that's one reason, of course, he doesn't leave anyone alive. So no one can, can tell um, the king uh, of Gath, actually, he's been killing your allies. Um, so David plays a trick on, on uh, Achish. And neither man nor woman did David leave alive to bring to Gath, thinking, lest they tell about us, saying, thus did David do. And such was his practice all the time he dwelled in Philistine country. And Achish trusted David, saying, He has surely become repugnant in Israel, and he will be my perpetual vassal. 
But David is in fact a triple agent. <laughs> <laughs> and it happened at the time that the Philistines had gathered their ranks for the army to do battle with Israel. And Achish said to David, You surely know that with me you must sally forth in the ranks, both you and your men. And David said, Then you yourself know what your servant will do. And Achish said to David, Then I shall make you my bodyguard for life. So it appears that David's made a deal. He said, you know, I'm going to go and fight, you know, the Judahites and the Israelites now. He says, oh, that's fine. But of course, we know what he'll actually do. <laughs> and that's where we'll stop for today. Because next week, we have the, the eve of this huge battle on the Mount of Gilboa between the Philistines and Israel. And Saul is so desperate that he goes and... Um, he seeks out um, what is normally known as the Witch of Endor, um, but um, Robert Alta describes her as a ghost wife. Uh, so we will hear about that. Any questions? <laughs> yes. How how much later than the events uh, discussed here, reported uh, here? Was it, when they, was it actually written now? Oh, no. Well, that, that's, I think that's a question way above my pay grade, actually. Right. I think... Because um, this is about... Is this about 1000 BC? Or? 1000 BC is approximately yeah. when yeah. David lived. I think we can say that it, it clearly... If you want to look at it in a sort of secular way, you can say yeah. this is all um, Davidic propaganda. Right. So yeah. it's, it's showing how God has chosen out the house of David mm. and, and of course it was an amazingly long lasting dynasty you know, over mm. half a millennium um, so you know it may well have been written down much later but you, you can also say that because you have these two very similar traditions but slightly different coming through mm. that it's not made out of whole cloth Somebody didn't sit down and say, let's make up a story about a king called David and this will justify the king being here yeah. now. People wouldn't have accepted that or believed that. So if we think that scripture is divinely inspired, that doesn't mean that there are human factors that come to make it up. Mm. Um, so yes, it's written down later, but it's drawing on oral traditions, which people would have remembered very precisely and very, um, yeah. you know, and, and they would have, they wouldn't have um, fallen for it being completely subverted and altered. Mm -hmm. And also, I think that we can say, okay, a lot of this is very human. A lot of uh, it was quite, mm -hmm. isn't it? You know, David is attractive sometimes, but not mm -hmm. others. Um, we might not have um, admired him all that much had we encountered him at the time, we might have been a bit scared of him. But that's not the point. God uses fallen humanity to bring about his purposes in this ancestor of Christ. Very good. I pray thee, loving Jesus, that thou, as thou hast graciously given me to drink in with delight the words of thy knowledge, so thou wouldst mercifully grant me to attain one day to thee, the fountain of all wisdom, and to appear for ever before thy face. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.